Thank you, Claudio. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk to you guys about some uh, optimizations to garbled circuits. Uh, this is joint work with Tal Malkin, who's my advisor, and Mike Ruslek is sitting right here. Um, so first, uh, let's recall old-fashioned garbling. Uh, right, so we want to garble this uh, circuit. Uh, how do we do this? Uh, we first choose, for each wire in the circuit, we're going to pick uh, two random labels. These are going to correspond to the values that can lie on the wire. Uh, and then to garble a gate, uh, we're going to take its truth table and we're going to view these wire labels as uh, encryption keys and uh, we're going to output the, to, we're going to encrypt the corresponding wire la output wire label under the corresponding uh, input keys. Uh, so for example, C0 is going to be encrypted under A0, B0, if this is an AND gate, uh, where the subscripts denote the, the truth values. Uh, and uh, right, we're also going to need to sort of permute these uh, rows of this encrypted uh, truth table uh, in order to hide uh, so we don't leak any information. Um, but I'm going to put this under the rug for the rest of this talk. Um, right, and so a garbled circuit is going to be this collection of garbled gates. And uh, the garbled encoding is going to be simply uh, one uh, label per input wire. Uh, exactly one label per input wire. And how do we evaluate a garbled circuit? Right, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we take, we have our garbled encoding, we have exactly one label per wire. This will allow us to decrypt exactly one row of the truth table, which will give us the outgoing wire label. And it's easy to see, oh, sorry. It's easy to see how this will compose so we can do entire circuits. So what are the properties of garbled circuits? Uh, informally, right, given a garbled circuit and a garbled input, uh, it doesn't, shouldn't reveal anything more than the output of the function that we're encoding. Uh, and why do we care about them? They tend to be very efficient. Uh, they only use symmetric key primitives. And uh, they're sort of naturally suited to generate uh, constant round protocols because you sort of garble the circuit in one shot and then you use uh, oblivious transfer to send the garbled input and uh, most of the things proceed in this manner. So there's a lot of applications, uh, two-party computation, zero knowledge proofs, uh, private function evaluation, um, and there have been many optimizations to the garbled circuit size. Why do we care about the size of the circuit, uh, right? These symmetric key operations that you're performing inside tend to be very cheap, so the main overhead is the communication complexity. Um, and also the, the size of the garbled circuit tends to, to also correspond to the computational complexity of evaluating it. Um, so yeah, there have been a long line of uh, optimizations uh, that tend to give sort of constant factor improvements on the size of the garbled circuit. Um, but yeah, looking at this framework again, the, all of these sort of, uh, this line of work, they tend to follow the same form. If we want to garble a circuit, we take a circuit, or garble a function, we take a circuit that represents it from some fixed circuit class, and then we garble it. And this is where the optimizations occur. And in general, in all of these schemes I mentioned that were on the previous slide, uh, the circuit tends to be, have fan in two gates, which is great. Uh, and the, the size of the garbled circuit, even given these optimizations, somehow roughly corresponds to the number of gates in the circuit. This is, this is all well and good, but uh, it can lead to sort of problems where, so if we want to compute like sort of the conjunction of uh, n values, we want to garble this, uh, this is going to require roughly is n gates if we have any sort of constant fan in. Um, right? <clears throat> which, but it, it, we can also think about circuits where this is just a single gate. And in particular, in our scheme, we give a scheme where we can garble an AND gate, a uh, conjunction of N inputs for uh, log, like polylogarithmic number of ciphertexts. So what do we do? Uh, in brief, we show that uh, natural arithmetics generalization of uh, simple existing, or existing techniques uh, can yield uh, exponential improvements in garbled circuit size when you're computing over either the integers and surprisingly even on, for Boolean things, as I mentioned before. So uh, sort of a summary of what we achieved. So if you're computing over a bounded domain over the integers, 
uh, we can do addition. We show our scheme will allow you to compute addition with uh, no cost in the garbled circuit size uh, versus sort of a linear cost in uh, pre-existing schemes. Uh, weighted threshold gates, uh, you can be garbled for cost that's independent of the fan in. You can exponentiate by any fixed exponent with cost that's independent of the exponent. And in the Boolean domain, um, some more highlights. Uh, so threshold gates can be garbled for a log cubed number of ciphertexts as opposed to a superlinear number of ciphertexts. And uh, fan in and uh, AND gates can be garbled for a uh, log squared number of ciphertexts as opposed to a linear number. So uh, let's unpack some of our techniques. Uh, first, uh, this is not our technique, but it's sort of the, the building point of ours. So uh, Kleshnikov and Schneider were sort of looking at computing XOR gates. And they showed that if you pick your wire labels in a very particular manner, things become very, 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 as cheap as you can imagine. So, right, so how are we going to choose our wire labels? We call this linear wire labels. So A and B are going to sort of be local masks for each wire, and delta is going to be sort of this global difference vector that's going to hold the value, the true, the true value. And so, for example, the wire A, uh, capital A, the wire label capital A is going to either be this vector, this local mask A, or AX or delta. B is going to be the same, and then we're going to choose the local mask for the outgoing wire to simply be the XOR of the incoming wires. And this is very convenient. Why? Because if we simply XOR any two incoming wires, uh, wire labels, and uh, redistribute things, it's clear that uh, the result is the, the, X, the wire label corresponding to the XOR of the two input values. And we haven't revealed anything. And so why is this great, right? We don't need to send any information if we have an XOR gate. So uh, I'm going to sort of briefly describe what our sort of garbling scheme looks like, our circuit model that's sort of underlying the garbling scheme. And then later I'm going to talk about uh, some gadgets that we use to think about sort of normal gate functionalities. So uh, instead of working mod 2, like free XOR, we're going to work over modulus moduli that aren't necessarily two. Uh, so our wires are going to be over these, these uh, rings of integers. Uh, and our wire labels are going to be exactly like in free XOR, this local mask and uh, this delta, which is going to carry this sort of true value. Uh, the gates that we're going to have in our circuit model, we're going to have an addition gate, right? This is just going to compute uh, the sum of values mod m, uh, right? The garbled gate, to garble this, right, we're not going to send anything at all. And the evaluator simply will sum up the wire labels that he has, mod m. And exactly the same way as on the free XOR, right, the true value, the value coming out will, the wire label coming out will correspond to the sum of the values, mod m. Uh, the other uh, gate that I'm going to talk about here that we have is a projection gate. And so this is a unary gate where uh, you pick an arbitrary function from uh, ring z mod m to uh, mod m prime phi, arbitrary function, right, as I said. And to garble this, we're just going to do the old-fashioned way, uh, just garble the truth table. And the total cost of this is going to be m ciphertext. Uh, now, the problem is we're, the domains that we're interested in, we're interested in working over large moduli. Uh, which I guess has not become clear yet. But right for large M, this is going to be prohibitively expensive. Um, but one thing to sort of keep in mind for the remainder of this talk is that uh, Z, if we choose M to be the product of a bunch of co-prime numbers, right, in particular, say, the K smallest primes, then uh, using Chinese remainder theorem or whatever you want to call it, uh, right, the ring of integers mod m is going to be uh, uh, isomorphic to this uh, small ring of small, uh, product of small rings. And so in particular for certain uh, maps phi, which are sort of modularly invariant, uh, which tend to be the ones that uh, were in, we were interested in this case, um, if we think of, instead of having a single wire label mod m, 
we still we have sort of this collection of wire label, K wire labels, each over in this small in these small rings. Then we only need, and our fee is modularly invariant. Then we only need to compute these projection gates on each of the small rings. And so now, rather than the total cost looking like the product of all of these primes, M, instead, the total cost of these, these uh, little projection gates is going to be the sum of the primes, which is where this uh, sort of uh, exponential gain is coming from. So. Uh, so now uh, let's look at some of our gadgets. So right, so if we want to compute over uh, bounded integers, uh, let's take z as a sort of global bound on uh, intermediate values of computation, right? Uh, addition is going to be free using the addition gate that I mentioned previously, um, right? This is in, doesn't, right, because of the isomorphism I mentioned before, we don't care if we're working over product ring or the actual ring. Multiplication. Uh, is x is public to the evaluator and the garbler, then this is going to be free. Um, uh, there's sort of an asterisk here. We have a small additive uh, constant to the entire circuit, um, but uh, more free in morally, I guess. Uh, if x is known to the garbler, then the cost is going to be some, simply these, uh, those projection gates, those small projection gates that I mentioned in the last slide. Uh, and so it's just going to scale like the sum of the primes. Um, and if x is private, then for now, for the purposes of this talk, let's assume that x and y are non-zero. Then if we take a generator for the multiplicative group, we can uh, right, we have this sort of identity, right, that uh, g to the d discrete log base g x plus discrete log y is equivalent to x times y, right? Very simple identity. Uh, and we can use this if we take projection gates to map to the discrete log and then add and then exponentiate again. Uh, we achieve a similar cost for multiplication. So let's uh, look at an application of this. So if we want to compute the inner product, right, Alice has x, Bob has y, they want to compute the inner product of these two vectors. Uh, let's assume that we're working over 32-bit integers. Um, and Alice, Alice wants to garble like uh, the linear function corresponding to her input x. Uh, the total cost of this is going to be, right, each multiplication is going to cost uh, 365. The addition to add numbers is going to cost uh, nothing. And uh, there's a small overhead in uh, the oblivious transfer because we need to transfer things that are uh, sort of 2 to the 64. Um, and the result is roughly 10 times better than previous schemes, right? And this is very useful if, say, you want to garble something that involves a lot of inner products, like a kernelized uh, classifier or something like that. Um, and so now, for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, garbling and gadgets, which may be surprising that we have gains, um, because all of the things I've been talking about are sort of arithmetic looking. So, what we exploit is a very simple idea, right? The conjunction of n inputs is true if and only if uh, these uh, n values sum to n, in particular if they sum to n mod n plus 1, right? Very simple fact. And so how do we garble, use this to garble, right? If we take this uh, projection function phi, which is 1 if and only if uh, x is n mod n plus 1, uh, then we can simply, to garble an AND gate, we can simply sum the values and then project. And the result is only going to cost n ciphertext for the projection, right? Because the addition is free. And this is, uh, it should be n plus 1, but uh, if we use a simple row reduction technique, we can strip off the 1. So the optimal uh, way of garbling a, a conjunction of n values before was 2n minus 1. So already we have a constant factor improvement. Uh, but I promised you more. So how are we going to do this? We're going to go back to this sort of see our Chinese remainder theme, uh, theorem based idea. Right? And we're going to consider, say, we're going to consider working in the product of a ring that's the product of primes again. And now to check, let's, to check if uh, the sum of the xi's is n, we only need to check if the sum of xi's is equivalent to n mod 2, equivalent to n mod 3, and so on. 
And if all of these are true, then we know that it's equivalent to n mod uh, all of this larger product, which is greater than n plus one and doesn't allow wraparound. So how are we going to do this? We're going to introduce a little bit of redundancy. Um, instead of having a single wire label for a uh, value x, we're going to have k wire labels, each corresponding to the small prime in the, the small primes in this product ring. And then to garble writes, we're going to sort of do something very similar to before. In each small ring, we're going to sum up the ciphertext that lie in this ring. Then we're going to test if it equals n using the same sort of fee function that I mentioned on the last slide, which is going to cost uh, whatever, the prime, whatever the size of that ring is, number of ciphertexts. And then we're going to take a conjunction of the output of all of these things, right, these k things. And so, and this is using the same and that we mentioned on the last slide. And so the total cost of this, right, is k, which is the cost for the, the sort of meta and, and then these equality tests, which each one costs whatever the prime is. And the total cost is uh, roughly log, log squared in n times n, asymptotically, which is, which is a bit shocking. And, and so, right, this is, you know, it's an exponential improvement on what was known before. So just to sort of review, uh, so here's some sort of concrete numbers for arithmetic performance of our scheme, right? Addition, we're doing very well. Multiplication by a constant, we're doing very well. Uh, exponentiation, we're doing very well on these, uh, particularly well on these small numbers. Multiplication, we're still doing well on these small numbers before sort of these uh, techniques for large multiplication card SUBA or uh, fast Fourier transform things become relevant. Um, uh, comparison is where we start to fail. Uh, it's, comparisons are not very good. And uh, right, we have a small uh, overhead on uh, oblivious transfer costs. So what remains to sort of improve, it'd be nice to have a multiplication that's asymptotically competitive with the best known Boolean techniques. Um, cheaper comparison, this is a huge problem. And similarly, converting things to binary is scale is roughly, comp as we know how to do it now, is comp comparable to comparison, um, which is not great. And in the Boolean regime, right, uh, we're doing extremely well in, uh, for these AND and OR gates, or which are a specialized version of threshold gates, uh, at a small, small cost in uh, the uh, initial, small initial overhead. Right, so it'd be nice to see if you could do, have similar performance gains without uh, paying for it up front. And that's what I have. We have plenty of time for questions. So in, in your comparisons with the standard techniques, did you consider uh, covering the, the, the task as a single gate, or did you look at the, at the circuit that implements the same task? Uh, uh, a circuit that implements the same task. Okay. Right, so because like, uh, if it was a single gate, then it would be uh, like huge. So you're not cheating? No. no okay. No. <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, Paul Grubbs. Um, I I don't think you said this, but like, um, what M did you choose? Like, did you do any analysis? M is going to be so like if you're working over integers, right? M is going to be uh, right the of the big the moduli of the big ring is going to be uh, like uh, two to the sixty four or something like that. Right, whatever, whatever bound, so if we're, if we're doing arithmetic, M is going to be a bound on intermediate values in the computation. And if we're doing, if we're working over Boolean values, it's going to be a bound on Fanon, so like the width of the circuit or something like that. So it's just determined by the circuit. Is, is there any kind of like performance trade-off involved in picking those values? Or it's just like you have a circuit on some values and then there is a value for that circuit? Well, so I guess there's a trade-off if you, if you, Right. Um, if you can, if you have an efficient representation, like measured in gates with large Fanon in this Boolean regime, then um, yeah, it's better to pick 
pick that and have m as large as possible, right? Because you'll have exponential gains. But uh, if, if say, you want to do something like XOR or something like that, maybe it makes sense to sort of split your circuit in half and use sort of normal techniques on part of it and then these wide fan in techniques on other parts. I don't know. I don't know if that answers your question. Any other questions? Let's thank Marshall again. Thank you.